I want to begin by saying with regard to compassion that it's useful to distinguish compassion from other things like empathy and kindness. Now, as with so many states of being, so many experiences, the distinctions between these are a little fuzzy. Researchers get engaged in really super duper categorizing them and segmenting and partitioning these uh, constructs, these ideas. But in our experience, right, they sort of swirl together and um, several can be involved at the same time. So I'd like to just very briefly mark the distinctions, at least in terms of how I'm using the words, uh, among or between um, empathy, compassion, and kindness. And then I'm going to explore with you uh, ways that are somewhat grounded in the, what we know about the brain increasingly, that we can cultivate empathy and in particular cultivate compassion. And along the way, I'll talk about some pitfalls, uh, some things to uh, be aware of, uh, some kind of key distinctions to make, and then open it up for your discussion and questions. Um, I think this topic is, of course, perennial. It's uh, a universal subject. I was just reading an interview with the Dalai Lama recently in which he said every morning when he wakes up, the first thing he thinks about is altruism. That's the word he used. In other words, you know, really caring about others in a broad, far-reaching kind of way that includes compassion. It's available for anybody at any time. And as there is a lot of suffering, always. There was suffering in the time of the Buddha. There's suffering in the world today. Uh, many people, including myself, are particularly concerned about the suffering in Ukraine. And, um, you know, that's, that's top of mind for many people. So the subject seems quite timely, right? Okay, so empathy essentially means that we get a sense over here of what it's like for someone else over there. In effect, we're simulating a bit, as accurately as possible, of their thoughts, their feelings, and their, their, their embodied action. These are the three major elements of empathy, if you think about it. We have empathy for the thoughts of others, the feelings of others, and their embodied sense of actions. These three aspects of empathy kind of integrate, you know, they, they entwine together. Uh, neurologically, we tend to um, have empathy for the actions of others in, that in, in ways that involve mirror-like networks, off, typically situated in the temporal parietal junction between the temporal lobes on the sides of your brain and the kind of parietal lobes in the back. And in the areas where they come together, um, there are neurons that activate when we perform an intentional action. And then some fraction of them also activate when we observe others performing that same action, which gives us a sense from the inside out of what it's like to be them in a very fundamental kind of way. Second, empathy for emotions. Uh, the feelings of others uh, involves a part of the brain mainly uh, called the insula on the inside of both temporal lobes. And it's a part of the brain that's very engaged in interoception for ourselves, tuning into our own feelings, especially our deeper feelings, our gut feelings. And the you know, cells inside the insula that get active when we're having an emotional experience also activate when we recognize that somebody else is having that particular emotional experience. It's a very efficient way, neurologically. Mother Nature is conservative. She conserves resources for the sake of all her little children. Uh, it's a neurologically efficient and conservative way uh, to get a sense from the inside out using the same neurological equipment uh, of what, it's, what the feelings of another person might be. And then there is empathy for the thoughts broadly, the intentions, the plans, the dispositions, the biases, the deceptions sometimes even of others uh, that we could call empathy for thoughts that are, that are mainly enabled by regions in the prefrontal cortex toward the front of the brain that offer and provide what's called theory of mind in which we develop theories essentially about the mental processes of others. Uh, and this 
part of the brain is also involved in our own thoughts. So here too, we have this efficient principle of drawing on that which enables us to have the sense of action, um, to have emotions and to have thoughts, to draw on the same neural hardware to intuit or to sense or to imagine or theorize about the experiences of other people. A little detail, theory of mind circuitry tends to come online around the third or fourth birthday. Prior to that, it's kind of hard for little kids, two-year-olds, one-year-olds, even three-year-olds, to realize that other people might be having very different experiences <laughs> than oneself. Uh, uh, but over time, we become more and more able to, um, to imagine the thoughts of other people. It's probably the case that as if a person starts to dement, move into dementia, say, um, with age or with injury to the brain, uh, the capacity to imagine the thoughts of others and to form hypotheses about what others might be thinking, broadly defined, and then test those hypotheses, those aspects of theory of mind are probably the first to go. While the person has conserved empathy for emotions and empathy for actions, which means that um, people perhaps um, who are aging and are maybe moving into dementia, they may not be able to think so clearly, let's say, about what other people are thinking, but they can still get vibes. They can still pick up emotional vibes uh, in terms of our feelings for them and attitudes toward them and, and intentions toward them. And I think that's a very important thing to take into account, even if it's clear that let's say, an aging grandparent um, is no longer able to follow the, the words in a conversation, the, the ideas in a conversation. Okay? Empathy. Now, empathy is morally neutral. Con artists, tricky salespeople, uh, authoritarian tyrants need to be pretty empathic for the feelings that they're manipulating or um, exploiting. In, that are occurring in other people. So they can have empathy. Uh, uh, someone who lacked empathy would not, be a use, would not be a very effective con artist or authoritarian demagogue. Empathy itself is neutral. That's where compassion and kindness come in because in compassion and kindness, there is benevolence. There is a sense of caring for them and wishing them well. Now, in compassion, there's a response to suffering that's inherent in the nature of compassion. So compassion is bittersweet, has two elements to it. Empathy for suffering and um, a benevolent movement to, to care and to have a kind of sympathetic, tender-hearted concern, often with a desire to help if one can. So there are these two elements in compassion, the bitter and the sweet. Uh, I've known people who offered a kind of generic compassion, including for me, who could not be bothered with empathy. Compassion, apparent compassion, without empathy, in my view, is not courageous and does not really have traction. It's a big deal. It's a very important thing to allow the suffering of others to land in your heart and to be resourced enough and brave enough to be able to really feel it. Now, here's an important point that also relates to a question that got raised in, in, the, in the chat sidebar. There is such a thing as empathy fatigue, or sometimes people might talk about empathic burnout or empathic distress. And that's definitely true. Compassion fatigue is less common because the caring, the lovingness, the good wishes that are a necessary element of compassion are protective and nourishing and even actually rewarding to the person who is experiencing them. Interesting neurological research on compassion shows that when people are rested in compassion, they often are starting to activate reward centers in their own brain. It's the suffer, the empathy for the suffering is painful. Compatio, compassion, means to suffer with. So the we feel it. 
huh. And also, there is the lovingness and the, the meaningfulness and the enjoyableness in some ways, the natural opioid and oxytocin involving um, caring, uh, radiating outward from us for the person who is suffering. It's important when being compassionate to, yes, have empathy for the pain with mainly a lovingness, a supportiveness, a care and concern. So there's bitter and sweet, but the sweet in real compassion, especially sustainable compassion, is, is bigger than the bitter. Important point. Um, kindness, and then I'll kind of swing back to compassion itself and talk through some key points about it and open it up for you. Kindness does not presuppose suffering. Kindness, in effect, is the wish that beings be happy. Compassion, fundamentally, is the wish that beings not suffer with a, with a movement of emotion and sometimes action uh, as a response to that suffering. So compassion presupposes suffering, but kindness does not presuppose suffering. In practice, we often will feel a mingling of the two with someone who is suffering. We'll, have, we'll wish that they weren't suffering so in the minus 10 to plus 10 range of human experience, we will wish that they come up from being underwater. We can also wish that more than just coming up underwater and having their suffering ease, that they move into well-being. They move into happiness and flourishing in some broader way. You know, the two can come together, compassion and kindness both. But there is that distinction between them. And tracking this distinction, not to be pedantic or scholarly about it, although there are people who are, and that's for great. I'm, I've learned a lot from them. But to just be aware of the, the different ways it feels. You know, compassion, it's like, oh, yeah. You know, kindness can include that, oh. And also there's, it's, there's a more of a, oh, let's, let's see if there are ways that, that you could be happier, that this could feel better for you. So a loose distinction between the two. Now I want to offer a few points about compassion, and then I'll take a peek at the sidebar and see what uh, points have come in here. To be able to sustain compassion, kind of implicit in what I said a moment ago about the difference between um, empathy burnout and compassion burnout, to be able to sustain compassion, research shows that you, you need to have a kind of intactness in your core that is not overwhelmed and flooded and swept away by the, com by the suffering of others. Now, we may be initially just blown away by what we see there. Like we're mainly aware of the suffering and that's what is predominant in our own consciousness as we open to and recognize what's happened to other people. Whoa. But to be able to sustain compassion and mobilize compassion, it does help to find some kind of differentiation, some kind of room to breathe inside yourself um, in the service of compassion. There's a saying in developmental psychology, distance in the service of attachment. It's a kind of Aikido move in which we take a step back to kind of find our footing so that we can then take a step in and sustain that stepping in over time. So if you're a person who is particularly open to others, maybe by temperament, you know, having just a sensitive temperament, there's a thing called being a highly sensitive person, HSP, uh, that actually is embedded in our constitution at birth. You know, it's, it's nature, not nurture, and then nurture can play its own role in terms of sensitizing people to others. So if you're a particularly open, permeable, soft boundary, porous boundary kind of person, uh, you might want to pay attention, especially if you're starting to feel compassion fatigue, compassion burnout, to focusing more on the lovingness, uh, the caringness, the good wishingness aspect of compassion. And also second, focus more if you're getting exhausted with your compassion on shoring yourself up internally and establishing more of a kind of refuge inside yourself. You're, in which you're rested in, let's say, the green zone, kind of rested there, from which you can then offer compassion. 
Another key point, compassion, as I said briefly during the meditation, is not approval or agreement or affection. And research shows that uh, typically it's harder for people to offer compassion to those that they think are the source of their own suffering or to those who they think um, should have justice you know, visited upon them. Understandable as this is, in principle, compassion is independent of our evaluation of others, whether they are someone who we love dearly or if they're someone who uh, has mistreated us, sometimes both, or if they are someone who we think it's their fault that they're in that pickle. You know, if they hadn't gotten drunk, um, they wouldn't have and dr driven, then they wouldn't have crashed into the tree. Psst. So yeah, they got a broken leg, but huh, hard to find much compassion for them, right? Well, as understandable as that is, um, it's not necessary. We can have just as much compassion for a sinner as for a saint. And we can have just as much compassion in principle for our adversaries as well as our allies. It's a lot harder to mobilize compassion for sinners and adversaries maybe than, than for saints and allies. But that just means that in a funny kind of way, mobilizing compassion for people that are neutral or difficult or really difficult for you is a great way to build up your compassion muscles for people that are easier to have compassion for. You can be aware of the ways that we kind of maybe withhold compassion uh, from people that we don't like or disagree with or we think are, are harming others because they are, let's say. Uh, and you can be aware and mindful of that, that little pullback inside if that's the case for you. Okay. Another point is that compassion is for us, not just for them. We can be aware of our own suffering and mobilize tender concern for ourselves, much as we would for others. Um, it helps to be clear about the morality of this because very often people have beliefs that obstruct their self-compassion. They think, oh, I don't really you know, deserve compassion like other people do because I'm bad or I did something shameful or it would be vain, it would be selfish, it would be selfish, it would be self-centered. Uh, or maybe it would make me lose my edge, you know? What keeps me going is that harsh self-criticism, um, yakety yakking 24 seven. Well, all that is understandable and wrong. Uh, you know, the universal principles of decency and, and um, benevolence toward all beings applies to ourselves. We're included in all beings. Also, uh, the golden rule is a two-way street. We should treat ourselves as we call ourselves to treat others. Also, a lot of research shows that building up self-compassion makes people more resilient. It increases their sense of worth it moves them more readily toward pro-social conduct toward others, and it fosters ambition because people are then not so afraid that if they fall short, that inner critic will be pounding away. Self-compassion, it's a very, very, very good thing. All right. I'll finish by offering a couple of practical ways into compassion, and then we'll kind of open it up, all right? Uh, <clears throat> As I did in the meditation, uh, it can help to tune into the area around your heart. Uh, as the HeartMath Institute and other researchers in what's called heart rate variability have, have shown, and with Steve Porges and his polyvagal theory, the, um, there's a lot of uh, nervous system activity that's pretty primal that innervates, that's the technical term, those little neural tendrils, zip, slipping into your heart area. And those uh, that are, you know, earliest, first of two major branches in the vagus nerve complex is um, very involved with regulating the heartbeat. The second more recent branch 
goes upward from the brainstem, while the first branch heads downward into the viscera, including the heart. And this more recent branch moves into the face and the cranial nerve, number 11, I think, and into the inner ear uh, so that we can tune into uh, warm tones of voice from others. And we can also, um, you know, with our micro expressions around our eyes, you know, convey caring and concern and also read and understand, you know, uh, pro-social uh, attitudes toward us, toward us and communications toward us coming from other people. So you have this vagus nerve complex with two related branches and activity in one ripples into the other. So as we tune into the area of the heart, um, it sure seems plausible and wow, it sure does seem experientially true that you start to have not just you know, raw sensation in the area of the center of your chest, but a more general feeling of warmth and open-heartedness and warm-heartedness and caringness toward others. As well as all that, who knows? I think uh, uh, it's very possible that there are subtle energies, subtle chakra systems in the area of the heart that I'll share something I've learned along the way. In a clockwise motion, even around the area of your heart, you can have a sense of opening. And there are those who are wonderful chakra teachers. And I think of this a lot as run the experiment in your own experience. See what you get when you kind of get a sense of opening your heart in a clockwise motion or imagining a kind of uh, energy or light moving through your heart as you breathe that has a kind of a green quality to it, uh, you know, the, the heart chakra energy. See if, see if that has any effect for you. Okay, so with that, second, we can mobilize heartfelt feelings in general that kind of warm up the circuitry of the social engagement system uh, and preparation for compassion. So whether it's just bringing to mind your dog, your friend, your kid, uh, someone who's been a benefactor for you, a teacher, or an ally, uh, someone you respect a lot, who's helped you a lot maybe, just you know, tuning in to the feeling, keeping it simple, the feeling of being with that being um, can start to warm up your circuitry in preparation for compassion. You might also get a sense of caring for you flowing in you know, or feeling like you're part of a group that includes you, a team at work, a group of friends, uh, your softball league, uh, you know, your, your own team, uh, you know, you're just hanging out. That's a nice way to kind of warm up the circuitry. Then another thing that, that supports compassion um, is, if you like, a cognitive element in which soft thoughts, and this is a traditional meditation, where in the back of your mind, you're finding soft thoughts, even in a structured way, classically in the Theravadan tradition, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be happy, may you live with ease. Now notice that the first two of these arguably address suffering, may you be safe, may you be healthy. The second of the four the second, the last two, uh, are more in the kindness territory, right? May you be happy. May you live with ease. In practice, compassion and kindness kind of come together. Or you might have some very specific compassion-related soft thoughts, like may you not suffer, or may I not suffer, if you're bringing compassion to yourself. Or thoughts like may... Um, May you be at peace with this pain in your back, or may you not worry so much about your kids, or may you not take that person so seriously. You know, may, may, may your pain, may your sorrow, may your fear, may your anger, may your shame, may your sadness come to ease. It's okay to have very specific thoughts. You want to focus on the feeling, especially of compassion, um, not get caught up in a complicated story or this and that about the person. Um, you might also have a sense of compassion rippling out from you in waves, right? Um, spreading out even in ways that are more general and non-specific, just kind of radiating out from you and touching others in ways seen and unseen, known and unknown. You might have a sense of your compassion 
as radiating from you in, an, as I said, a nonspecific way that others move through. So your compassion is not so contingent on whether you like them or who they are or how they treat you, but your compassion is more of an unconditional field through which others can move. Um, maybe your compassion is sort of in the background much of the time in a general way, and then maybe it's more foregrounded when your sense of the suffering of another is more specific and acute. But in general, it's really interesting to explore this sense of a kind of non-personal or less personal, transpersonal even, not, you know, compassion as a field uh, in kind of in, in which you're occurring. It's like the, you're in the field. It's the field that's moving through you. That takes me to my last comment about factors of compassion I'll just offer here, which involves a recognition of our interdependence. And there can be a way in which that insight uh, in the uh, Buddhist tradition, the word for insight in the language of early Buddhism is vipassana. And you may have heard that term um, in different meditation circles, especially as the more Southeast Asian or Theravadan branch of Buddhism has come to the West. So there's a sense of, there's a, a coming together of insight into our interdependence, the ways in which there's basically one tissue of mind and matter that is reality altogether, in which different eddies stream along in that one totality of reality, the one tissue. Uh, and in that recognition, we realize, oh, your suffering is my suffering. My suffering is your suffering. We're really all in this together. And that insight into interdependence um, naturally opens the heart. The classic image of this is the jewel in the lotus from the Tibetan tradition, in which there's this combination of both um, uh, tender-hearted concern for one for all beings, including oneself, that uh, is also intertwining with a penetrating and liberating wisdom. And so you may find that that these qualities come together. Compassion. All right. After all those words I've offered, I'm just feeling into it as this salve, like a healing balm on our wounds. Um, as Elaine and I were talking at the very beginning, there's so much inflammation, emotional inflammation, as Elaine put it, uh, in the world today. The world's on fire, burning, burning, burning. And ah, compassion is cooling and soothing for ourselves and for others. May it be so. So I'm gonna take a peek now at the sidebar, see what's what's come in. Um, looks, all right, great. Um, let's see, empaths. So I'm seeing that from many people. Um, it, this goes to the point I made that if we're highly empathic, and therefore can be flooded by suffering, what can we do? And I, I mentioned a few things. I'll mention a couple others that are really useful. Uh, one is to deliberately tune into the internal sensations in your body, particularly that are, that are neutral to positive, like the internal sensation of the chest rising and falling as you breathe. That right there engages interoception, so yes, the insula is engaged. So, you know, yes, and the insula is involved with empathy, but mainly what you're foregrounding is your own sensations, your own internal feeling of being, which implicitly contains in it an ongoing signal into your consciousness and into your brain that you're basically all right in the present. You're still breathing. You're still breathing. You're still going on being. That right there is a very useful way to shore up and stabilize your sense of here-ness so you're not overwhelmed by their there-ness, you know, flooding you. That's a really useful thing to do and to keep returning to it, keep returning to it. A second thing that's really helpful is to bring in the insight, the vipassana recognition that 
um, there is both radical interdependence and there is radical differentiation. Uh, their karmas are not yours. All the various causes and conditions in this life that led them to be experiencing what they're experiencing and, and having happen whatever is happening for them, that's theirs, it's not yours. You might have some similarities with them, but the fundamentals of their mind stream are differentiated from yours. And that might sound kind of conceptual, but over time, you, you really get it. And you start living in these two truths of, of one tissue, interdependence, and also distinction. There's a distinction between you know, the hand and the bottle. There is a distinction between you and me. If there were not this distinction, we could not cultivate in our own practice fruits of practice for ourselves, right? If there were not this distinction between me and you, there would be no basis for moral responsibility. There is this distinction between me and you. And so both tuning into your own internal sensations and uh, recognizing distinction and reminding yourself of distinction, even visualizing distinction as a kind of maybe picket fence between you and them. Or imagining, as you know, I use this metaphor, yourself as a deeply rooted tree through which the very intense winds of others um, can blow, shaking you, sure, some, but still, you're deeply rooted here, even grounded all the way down deeply into the earth. That's, that's a way you can support yourself for your own well-being. And you have rights to that um, for your own well-being, as well as for to sustain your capacity for the marathon of compassion, um, day after day, you know, being after being in this life. Okay, so let's see. Great, great. I'm seeing really useful comments coming in. Appreciate that. Um, yes. Oh, key point about compassion. I can see people addressing this too. Uh, so we have these two necessary elements of compassion, empathy and benevolence. And the benevolence has a can have an element that's more cognitive and based on moral principle, including deep insight into interdependence. Very often, and I think importantly, that benevolence has an emotional and somatic feeling in it. It's not just philosophical. We do care. You know, it's tender-hearted concern. We feel it, right? Third, there's the movement to help if we can. And it's important to appreciate that often there's nothing we can do except be compassionate. We can't change the loss that someone has suffered or that we've suffered. We'll never get that person back. We cannot change sometimes uh, um, injuries that people have experienced. We can't change systematic you know, oppression of them ourselves today. Uh, there are people on the other side of the world. We, we care about them, but there's not a practical basis for us to help them or for all kinds of complicated reasons. Uh, we're allocating our, our efforts elsewhere and we're making a choice to do that. All this, including as applied to yourself, does not mean that your compassion is empty or insincere. No. And actually knowing that your compassion can be sincere for those that you can't help or, frankly, for some reason, choose not to help, for good reasons, hopefully, choose not to help because you're helping others in other ways. Um, just because you can't help or won't help doesn't mean that your heart is not good and that you know, you're not caring. That's an important point. And applying this to yourself too. You can have supportive, compassion, respect for yourself, even if you're part of the source of your troubles, or even if you're not the source of your troubles, but you know, honestly, there's just nothing that you can change about what, you know, the pain that you're feeling right now. Really important point. Well, let's see. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, if there are those among you who would like to talk with me briefly with a question that's related to what we're talking about here and is succinct and clear, uh, you can raise your hand. You know how to use the raise hand feature. Maybe I'll tell you now in the smiley face at the bottom of your Zoom window, there's a reactions button. And if you tap that button, you can raise your hand and I'll see you. I'll tend to prioritize people that I haven't spoken with before just as we as we do this. That said, 
Madison, for sure. Uh, my friend Madison, I'm asking you to unmute. And okay, what do you what do you got? Hi, Rick. Um, I'll be very succinct. I've been working on this for years, and it doesn't seem to be getting much better. So I'm hoping, just asking this, it might be universal for some people. Um, I find the self-compassion is really difficult. I also am one of the rare people in your sangha, tell your people not to murder me, who does not feel deep empathy for the homeless that I see all over in San Francisco on the streets that I'm walking down. But I think um, both the lack of compassion sometimes for myself and for all the tents that I might see along the road come from this very strong sense of high self standards of what I ought to be doing and am yeah. failing to do and what they ought to be doing sure. and are failing to do. And I don't really get past it very often. So I love, and maybe I'm missing, maybe the answer was in there, but I would love to know what, what you might say about that. Great, 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 super duper. And no murder, no murder coming your way. Um, so uh, you are naming that you're getting at the point I made, which is that in principle, compassion is decoupled. It's independent of moral judgment. Now it's true, and you're not alone. You're not alone, Madison. You are a poster child for a very common tendency. It's hard for many people to mobilize compassion uh, for those that they are criticizing, including themselves. So right up front, you are a wonderful, you are exhibit A for this distinction between judgment and compassion. So right there. And what you might play around with is looking for easy examples. Like imagine someone first that's easy. You don't have any negative judgment for them. You like them, you respect them, you, you know, favor them, you even idealize them. Practice compassion with them. Then see if you can move to someone that you kind that you like, or you're friendly, but you don't. You don't have tremendous positive regard for them, but they're you know better than neutral. Mobilize compassion there. And then see if you can do it with a neutral person, someone you don't know. You, you don't know whether they're a saint or a sinner. You don't know, but you can mobilize compassion for them. I'll do it sometimes myself for people like in line in front of me or behind me at the market, something or other. Or as I go by someone on the freeway, I might glance over and kind of see them and just deliberately do a little compassion practice, a little kindness practice for them. These are things that you and other people can do. And I know I'm speaking to many, many people about this. So I would just start there. And then if you like, keep going. Uh, you are you have a good practice. You know how to practice. You're determined. Uh, you can uh, evaluate yourself very positively by following my homework here. Uh, and uh, then pick someone that you mildly, mildly criticize. Maybe because you criticize them in some area, but you think well of them in other areas. And by the way, the point I'm making here, the points I'm making here are general and you generally useful for practice, which are making distinctions, not to be a philosopher or an academic, although that's cool, but for practical reasons making distinctions between different aspects of our experiences and different factors. A. B, starting easy. Pluck the low-hanging fruit of people that it's easy to feel compassion and kindness for, and then gradually build out from there, the general broad principle. The last thing I'm, I'm gonna wanna say is that, and if the shoe fits, where, you, know, you, might, you can put it on if you want. For many people, frankly me included, Criticism is a kind of superpower. The recognition of the gap between ideal and actual, it's a kind of superpower. And it's useful, but what's really important is to use your superpower for good and not let it use you. Many of us are, natu have where are either naturally critical 
and live in a culture or have occupations or have personal histories or grew up in families that trained that, criti that criticality, trained it. And then that muscle becomes dominant. It's like that picture of Popeye. I forget it, but they, who had huge forearms and no biceps or vice versa, I don't remember. Someone will probably put a Popeye in the chat. And you wanna balance that superpower, all right? With don't let it use you, don't let it hijack you. Okay, that's my response. Hope, thank you. You have work to do and I will, I will judge you well if you do your homework and tell me about it. Okay, you take care. All right, Barbara, I'm asking you to unmute. Great and good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so early in the meditation, you mentioned the field of compassion. Yeah. I'm trying to imagine that as, is that something external to me? Because I've always thought of compassion as something internal that I'm generating from inside myself. So I was a little, I was trying to make sense of that and maybe it's both. Yeah. Can say a little bit about that. Right. Well, so in some sense, what I'm saying there, I'll, I'll call it kind of advanced. So it's like a lot of things, you know, if it's not yet in reach, that's okay, because it's more advanced and just acknowledging that. Uh, there are two ways to relate to it. One is that just in your own meditative or, you know, informal sense of you know, open-heartedness. I, I think there's a ways in that involve kind of highlighting the spaciousness aspects, you know, of caring and, and support. You know, the heart is opening. There's a, there's a sense of being open, you know, openness, opening. Very useful meditative factors and life factors to, to be attentive to. Maybe there's some recognition of, our sort of interdependent arising in the, you know, reality is, is one big field in effect in which everything's occurring. Um, so you start there and then in your experience, you, you might notice that it's just kind of starting to appear for you or you could kind of invite it. Where's this, where there's this softening of the sense of self, you know, a little bit and there's more of a sense of, oh, it's, it's kind of like there's a field. So the first way into this, as I said, there were two ways, or two ways to relate to it, is that the field is, an, is, a, is a subject of experience. It's an, it's an experience you're having that's more fieldish and less that you're here and they're there and you're you know, pouring compassion their way on your fire hose, right? Another way to relate to this is that there is literally a kind of transpersonal, non-local field of love, broadly, compassion or caring and concern that's just sort of baked into the underlying fabric of reality. And that's a more transpersonal view and even a transpersonal experience. Uh, these two ways of relating to this can kind of swirl together. Uh, I think a person might have an attitude of, don't know, not sure, could be super cool. I'll play with it, could be true, you know, as a way of combining those two, uh, you know, two ways of relating to this. Uh, so that's what I mean. Thank you. Okay? Well, All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think like a lot, it's, it's an exploration. Um, you know, you might play with it. It's sort of like initially you're breathing, but then it's more like the body is breathing you, right? You, you're familiar with, you can have a sense of that. So then you you have a sense of being lived by love. It's sort of, it's a movement through you. It's less personal. You know, these are ways into this. Okay, wonderful. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Edgel, Edgehall, asking you to unmute. You have to, there you. My, my middle initial is G, so it's just Ed Hall. Oh, Ed G Hall. Good. All right. Um, you may have touched on this earlier, but I sort of need more clarification or something that will stick with me. Um, I've had a lot of traumatic accidents and 
tough experiences, cancer and heart disease and so forth. Mm. I use a wheelchair and have used for years. So one of the county programs will provide um, a helper to come in to do certain things if you're a certain age and have a certain amount of disability. So it's very difficult for me to stand and reach and carry and lift. But right now I was given like 16 hours a, a month um, authorized for that, but I never got it. The, the, the point is that almost everyone that they have sent here is severely broken. They can't hold jobs in other places because of explosive anger or unwillingness to follow directions or, and so they're really broken and they come in and sometimes it takes, a, if I'm lucky, I can find something right away that they can do that will be helpful to me and I can appreciate. But sometimes they come in and they're just, they're not there. They're, they're, they're either faking an emotion, um, an attitude, um, that's really disturbing, yeah. or they just uh, not doing it. Um, and I'll give you two examples. Well, because is it just because we're over time already, Ed. Do you okay. have a specific question in what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, I'm. I, I find that I'm far more empathetic than I thought I was. One person couldn't function mentally, even though she's going to be a physician assistant. And when I asked her to straighten out my 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 place do anything she wanted to she it was like her brain froze but it affected me instantly not like i was separate from her uh -huh. but like it it made me dysfunctional so it ed do you have a question yeah what do i do how how do i how do i separate myself from being overwhelmed with their dysfunction i mean it's it's like i'm them I mean, that, that may be an exaggeration, but yeah. I, I react yeah. like they did, not not with compassion or I get overwhelmed and then I have to send yeah. them away. Yeah. Well, OK, so add just several things. First, you know, respects for what you've been dealing with and really in your situation and also commiseration for what it's like to be in the system and have limited access to care and and also compassion for those people and what their life has been and you know the the people in the agencies that send them out i mean it's a it's a whole mess and wouldn't it be great if we were more like finland i lived in finland for a year <laughs> Their social safety net is fantastic, right? Da, da, da. But it, it, we're not like that. So all that is true. Second, I'm I'm really struck as I kind of move quickly to an end here by what you've had to learn yourself and how your own suffering has tenderized your heart, as the saying puts it. And um, I have a hunch <laughs> that you're kind of a savant of compassion just because for all kinds of reasons, including your own life's journey. And that's just true for you. So you're, you're probably really open to others and you have a feeling for them and you're dependent upon them in some way. So that you know affects you as well. Uh, in terms of how to be about it, uh, I just would remind you of the things I said that tune into the body, have a sense of differentiation, um, you know, keep focusing on the benevolence aspect and the emotionally positive aspects of care and concern for other people that tends to help us not be so flooded by them. We're not so overwhelmed by the bitter. We're more rested in the sweet of our good wishes. Uh, you know, prepare yourself <laughs> for that next new person walks through your door. Given the odds, there's probably going to be some trouble there. And, you know, so you kind of prepare yourself. These all seem like really, really useful things uh, for me uh, to offer. And then I'll just leave it with something I, I could have, should have mentioned already. And it's been really highlighted by Kristen Neff and others around self-compassion, this notion of common humanity. There but for the grace of God go I, you know, there's reactivity in all of us, me included, we, we all suffer, we're all vulnerable to 
illness, aging, and death. Uh, we're all vulnerable to these things. And, and you know, it reminds me somehow of the Thich Nhat Hanh poem early on of both the pirates and, you know, the people they attacked and Thich Nhat Hanh recognizing himself in both of them. I don't know if you know his book, Being Peace. Yeah, that, that's a reminder there. So I should finish here. I, I wish I could say more, Ed. Maybe next time, you know, just pop that hand up sooner and we can come back here because there's probably more we could talk about. But I guess that's the best I can do in the time that I have. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.